In a time of war and conquest, they were the mightiest military power of their age. A force that vanquished armies, toppled empires. A dynasty which expanded to become the first great kingdom of Asia Minor. A state built on the most advanced legal system of its time. A civilization that formed the cultural link between the ancient East and West. A language that was the earliest example of all Indo-European languages. A mythology that influenced Greek and Roman literature, as well as the Bible. Kings that fought the pharaohs in the greatest battles of history. Defiant, proud men and women who ruled the Near East. An empire that changed the ancient world. The Hittites. A momentous battle is fought between the two superpowers of the day. On one side is the Egyptian army commanded by the legendary Ramesses II. Confronting Ramesses is a force that instills fear in all its enemies, but in time will become only an obscure footnote in the pages of history. A civilization forgotten for 3,000 years, until stunning archaeological discoveries will mark its rebirth. Asia Minor, today called Anatolia, a region covering the central and eastern part of Turkey. It is a land surrounded by Greece in the west, Iraq and Iran in the east, Syria in the south, and Russia in the north. In 1834, Charles Felix Marie Texier, a French archaeologist, was exploring in central Anatolia. Near the small town of Boaskoi, Texier discovered the ruins of a large ancient city. The mysterious city contained many walls and reliefs with strange hieroglyphic inscriptions. But at the time, the find generated little interest in the archaeological community. Forty years later, reliefs, statues and stamp seals with similar hieroglyphics began turning up all around Anatolia and Syria. The intriguing discoveries pointed to a civilization with a common script and vast territory stretching from western Turkey to northern Syria. In 1876, Archibald Henry Says gave a groundbreaking speech to the Society of Biblical Archaeology in London. Says claimed that he had established a connection among all the monuments and was able to partially decipher one of the stone reliefs. He argued that the inscriptions belonged to the Hittites. The academic community was stunned. Apart from a few passing references in the Bible, the Hittites were unknown to scholars. According to the Old Testament, they were just one among many tribes present in ancient Palestine. The great surprise of the, of the day was, of course, that this obscure tribe named in the Bible should have covered such a large territory and with their inscriptions and their political power. Once it was believed that the Hittites might have actually governed a large kingdom located between ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt and the Aegean, all eyes turned to Boaskoi. 
an excavation team led by Hugo Winkler and Theodore McCready began digging in Boascoy in 1906. The team quickly unearthed many tablets written in cunei form, a script formed by pressing a reed stylus into clay to make wedge-shaped signs. These symbols stood for syllables and words that were read left to right. Many of the texts were composed in Akkadian, the international language of ancient times. Akkadian had already been deciphered, so scholars could immediately read these tablets. Just a few weeks into the dig, the workers excavated a remarkable document, a clay tablet with a text referring to a so-called unpleasantness between the Egyptians and the Hittites. Closer examination revealed that the text was actually a peace treaty between the pharaoh Ramesses II and Hattusili III of the Hittites, signed after the Battle of Kadesh. This made the treaty 3,000 years old. It was a very important peace treaty and probably one of the very earliest, if not the earliest, peace treaty in the world. And as such, you can still see it today uh, exhibited in the entrance to the Security Council of the United Nations in New York. In just six years, the team excavated more than 10,000 tablets and fragments. The deciphered text revealed that Boascoy was no ordinary Hittite city. It was actually the Hittite capital, and its ancient name was Hattusha. Many texts were written in Akkadian, but there were hundreds composed in a completely unknown language. This had to be Hittite. Archaeologists knew that to learn more about the Hittite kingdom, this language had to be deciphered. The Czech linguist Bedrick Rosny was an expert in cuneiform and eager to tackle the mysterious Hittite language. Throughout 1915, Rosny worked tirelessly to crack the code. He deduced that Hittite displayed grammatical features typical of Indo-European languages such as English and German. One day, Rosny succeeded in isolating the word for bread. He made the assumption that a phrase containing the word bread had to have words for eat and drink as well. He then deciphered a complete sentence. Now you will eat bread, further you will drink water. Bedrick Rosny had not deciphered just any language. He had actually deciphered the oldest known Indo-European language. Hittite is the language of the Indo-European language family for which we have the earliest records. The Indo-European family is that group of languages which is dominant in Europe today. Its oldest, uh, other, otherwise oldest known members are Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek, and so forth, and it's represented today by the languages which most of us speak, English, French, and so on. Uh, because it is so uh, associated with the European continent, it was uh, surprising to early scholars to discover a member of this group in Anatolia, which they considered to be part of Asia. Rosny's achievement paved the way for experts to decipher more than 25,000 Hittite tablets and fragments unearthed in Hattusha and other cities. Among these were treaties, letters, rituals, laws, prayers, and many more that shed light on the Hittites and the ancient Near East. Names of cities, scribes, kings and queens emerged from the tablets. Hittite men and women were finally ready to tell their own story after a silence of 3,000 years. In the 18th century BC, Anatolia was a land in chaos. Constant wars between the local city-states plunged the prosperous Bronze Age into a period of darkness. 
To survive, kingdoms had to become conquerors to avoid conquest by others. One group, known as the Hattians, were among the many caught in the turmoil. Along with the Hattians, another group inhabiting the region was a tribe of Indo-European speakers who probably arrived in Anatolia during the third millennium BC. In the 17th century BC, this group conquered the Hattians, took their name and assimilated their culture. These were the Hittites. The Hittites belonged to one of the tribes of the Indo-European stock. When, from where and from which direction they immigrated into Anatolia are the still unsolved questions of Hittitology. The Hattians were living in Anatolia when the Hittites arrived there to settle. The Hittites called their land, the land of Hatti, after the Hattians, and in fact, Hittite itself derives from the name for this people. The early years of the Hittite kingdom are shrouded by myth and legend. It's believed that around 1650 BC, the Hittite ruler managed to join all the disparate local people under his rule, establishing the Hittite kingdom. He then moved the capital of his new kingdom to Hattusha and took the name Hattusheli meaning man from Hattusha. Surrounded by the hostile Azawa tribes in the west and the formidable Hurrian and Mesopotamian states in the southeast, Hattusheli knew that he had to assert himself in the region. He immediately went on the attack. <laughs> In a short time, the Hittites conquered lands in eastern Anatolia and northern Syria. Any state that surrendered without a fight was spared plunder and devastation. But any kind of resistance attracted the full fury of the Hittite army. Hattusheli was a shrewd politician who knew that military success had to be backed by strong propaganda. As his conquests grew, he nurtured a superhuman image of himself. His frame is new, his breast is new, his penis is new, his head is of tin, his teeth are those of a lion, his eyes are those of an eagle, and he sees like an eagle. Hattusili I was a master of self-promotion. Uh, the texts that date to his reign uh, testify to this side of his character. He was a self-proclaimed lion, and he did everything he could to try and live up to this epithet, both in his military conquests and in his uh, handling of the tumultuous internal politics of the kingdom. Under Hattusheli's enigmatic, often ruthless rule, the young kingdom expanded. His military successes were forever embedded in Hittite folklore and annals. Hattusili I really gave birth to intellectual life in Hatti. Besides the historical texts that date to his reign, many of the early literary texts also belong in that period, as do the earliest uh, versions of the Hittite laws. Although writing in Hittite probably goes back to the period of the old Assyrian colonies, Hattusili introduced it to the new capital at Hattusha and really raised it to a level to compete with uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Hattusheli spent most of his reign on military campaign. Once he secured the kingdom's borders, he set his sights beyond the Taurus Mountains towards the enticing resources and ports of Syria. Against the approaching Hittite army, the Syrian states formed a coalition under the city-state of Aleppo, the most powerful in northern Syria. Hattusheli quickly conquered and plundered most of the north Syrian cities and then attacked Aleppo. But two campaigns failed. The 
eventually, he abandoned all objectives in Syria and returned home. Hattusili's last campaign as a ruler had resulted in defeat. Around 1620 BC, Hattusili was ailing. On his deathbed, the aging monarch proclaimed his grandson, still only a child, as his legitimate successor. Hattusili's last words were engraved on the same tablet that Bedrick Rosny would use to decipher the Hittite language three and a half thousand years later. Laziamo Ari. Takaniatamo Sapa and Harak. Nomo Takaniatamo Taknats. This was a fragile time for the new kingdom. Their great leader was dead, and their borders were frail. Syria remained unconquered, and Hattusili's young grandson, Murshili, was on the throne. But by the time he was roughly 20, the youthful king was ready to complete his grandfather's unfinished business. The conquest of Aleppo had eluded Hattusili. After establishing control in Anatolia, Murshili marched to Syria and destroyed Aleppo. He then set his sights on a preeminent land to the southeast of Syria, Babylonia, the kingdom once ruled by the famous Hammurabi, the lawgiver. Around 1595 BC, Murshili and his army crossed the Euphrates, marched 600 miles, and sacked Babylon. Murshili's victory put an end to the illustrious Babylonian Empire. Murshili's attitude towards the vanquished, such as the Syrians and the Babylonians, was the same as his grandfather's. If the enemy surrendered without a fight, they were spared devastation. But if they resisted, an example was made of them. Their land was torched and prisoners and booty were transported back to Hattusha. A new leader, usually a native who pledged allegiance to the Hittite king, was installed on the throne. The Hittites assimilated the rich cultures of the many lands they conquered but the core of Hittite culture remained rooted with the indigenous Hattian people. Every aspect of life, from pottery to religion, revealed traces of the Hattians. In this period, Hittite artisans, such as potters and seal makers, labored to create artifacts with images depicting scenes ranging from rituals to marriages. meticulously crafted seals with minute details contained the names of kings and queens. These seals were the very business cards of the Hittite royalty in international affairs. An official claiming to represent the Hittite ruler had to present his seal when asked. The practice of using seals uh, was very important, of course, in a largely illiterate society for general legal validation. And it's clear that most Hittites, down to quite lowly administrators, would have had one or more personal seals. The seals are mostly known to us from impressions on clay, on ceilings and on tablets. The royal seals were very fine and very beautiful. They would have the names written in hieroglyphic in the centre and in the cuneiform script around the outside, whereas the administrator's seals have only, use only, as a rule, the hieroglyphic script. They also give us a great deal of information, both about the royal family, where queens often shared a seal with, with, with the kings, and also about the uh, personnel of the administration. The Hittites began depicting stories in their pottery almost a thousand years before Western cultures. Hittite vases, with their strong narratives, remain the greatest visual source of information about Hittite society. 
The Hittite ceramics can be classified in two categories, those used in the daily life and homes, and those used in the religious ceremonies. This second group is made up of large vases decorated with beautiful reliefs. They are called the relief vases. With two or four friezes containing colored reliefs, they depict religious ceremonies or sacred marriages. These relief vases not only give us detailed information about Hittite rituals, acrobats, and music, but also form an excellent precursor and companion to Hittite rock reliefs with similar depictions. These vases are probably the most important achievement of Hittite art of the period. The influence of Huttian culture was nowhere greater than in Hittite religion. Huttian gods and myths formed the foundation of Hittite theology. The Hittites took a lot of things that we would consider natural phenomena and considered them manifestations of a particular god. So their religion, we would say, is polytheistic and it was naturalistic. They had a high regard for the environment, the world around them, because it was sacred, because the gods themselves were a part of it. And their behavior, not only in the temples, but in daily life, had to reflect that same regard and reverence for all of life, which was, to them, religious. The storm god and the sun goddess, the divine couple, presided over a complex pantheon of gods linked with everything from war to agriculture. The gods were human in character. They could deceive, laugh, and make love, but they were immortal. In Hittite belief, gods depended on humans for offerings and devotion, while humans relied on their gods for comfort and wealth. Pleasing the gods ensured a good harvest and even military success. But neglecting or offending the gods brought upon the people the direst punishment, sometimes extending into the afterlife. The portrait of the afterlife is extremely pessimistic. The netherworld was cold and dark, and the poor dead eat uh, only mud and drink dirty waters. The cause of the god's wrath could only be discerned with complex oracles. Anything from examining the entrails of an animal or the flight pattern of birds could help elicit information from the gods. Some tablets even contain diagrams of migratory paths for future reference. Once the oracles revealed the reason, the gods' anger could only be appeased with rituals and offerings. Many Hittite tablets contain strict instructions for rituals. From the texts, the Hittites emerged as a very religious and pious people. But on the other hand, they never lost reality or practicality out of sight. For example, when a king had to conduct a ritual to solve, say, a medical problem, he would have to send a, a bull hundreds of miles away. He would lay his hand on it, and the evil would flow from him into the bull, and the bull would have to be adorned with ribbons, etc. But then at the end, the text says, well, it's a long journey. If the bull dies on the way, just take a new one, put all the stuff of the dead bull on him, and bring that one to it. The Hittites developed their religion by absorbing and embracing the gods of all the lands they conquered. New deities and temples were constantly added to the Hittite religious realm. The Hittites themselves probably originally had a smaller nucleus of gods. But as they met various peoples in and around Anatolia, or as they campaigned in Syria and encountered the gods of other peoples, they had an inherent respect for these gods and wanted to have those gods on their side, not enemies against them. And for this reason, they would incorporate the worship of those gods in their own pantheon with regular sacrifices. With this assimilation, Hittite religion expanded its influence far to the west, shaping the religions of many lands. In time, the Hittite storm god would evolve into the Greek Zeus and the Roman Jupiter. In the end, the Hittite pantheon would become so complex 
that the Hittites would be called people of a thousand gods. At the center of Hittite religion stood the king. His most important duty was his role as the chief priest of the land. He was the conduit between the gods and their subjects. On the one hand, he represented the human community before the gods and requested from the divine fertility for crops, victory for Hittite armies, and such things. On the other hand, he was answerable to the gods for the conduct of his human subjects. Another way a king could describe himself was as the adopted child of a god, that is, adopted, since the king was clearly believed to be a mortal at birth, born from a mortal father and mother, and at birth he would be adopted by the gods. It was only at death that the king became a god. Uh, a son, a royal son, would never say of his father, when my father died. He would always say, when my father became a god. Around 1590 BC, King Murshali returned home from a long and successful military campaign. The kingdom's prospects were promising, but one pivotal event changed everything. The assassination of Murshali by his brother-in-law plunged the kingdom into a period of chaos. For the next 65 years, most kings seized the throne by murdering their predecessors, and few were able to rule more than a few years. The kingdom was weak and divided. It seemed on the verge of collapse. By the time King Telepinu ascended the throne, in 1525 BC, the kingdom had lost most of its territory to the west and the east. Immediately after his accession, rivals to the throne murdered his son and wife. The assassins were caught and scheduled for execution. But in an extraordinary demonstration of restraint, Telepinu did not execute the conspirators. Instead, he banished them from the land. He witnessed the havoc that was wrecked in his kingdom in the previous generations by mutual uh, reciprocal striving for the kingship and assassinating uh, other people. And so when he came to the throne, he, his main concern in his reign was to stabilize the Hittite kingdom, to restore unity in the royal family, and to see to it that there was a regular form of royal succession in the future. Let a prince, a son of the chief wife, become king. If there is no prince of the chief wife, let the son of a second wife become king. But if there is no prince, no heir, let them take a son-in-law, husband of a daughter of the first wife, and let him become king. Telepinu recorded the rules of future royal succession in one of the most important documents in Hittite history. It has become known as Telepinu's proclamation. The Telepinu proclamation marked a new chapter in what was already a unique legal system in the Near East. Unlike his contemporaries, Hittite law was based on compensation rather than retribution. The laws, with their 200 provisions, covered many aspects of Hittite life, from marriage to agriculture. It was a dynamic legal code, evolving and undergoing reform as conditions changed and new cases arose. One of the aspects of Hittite law that I find most fascinating, which is unique in the ancient world, is that they kept a record within the law itself 
of any changes that they made, any modifications. You might have a law that would run something like this. If a man breaks another man's foot, he, must pay, he used to pay 50 shekels, but now he pays 25 shekels. Any subject of the kingdom, or even of the vassal states in distant lands, could complain of injustice and obtain a fair ruling. The king's instructions to his governors and his family members were clear. Into whatever city you return, summon forth all the people of the city. Whoever has a suit, decide it for him and satisfy him. Do not make the better case the worse, or the worse case the better. Do what is just. The Hittite laws were the way the Hittite king implemented the desire of the sun god to protect weaker classes of people. And that is why I do not consider it a restrictive law in the bad sense, but rather restricting the extreme cruel treatment that could otherwise have been meted out to people who didn't have protection. The laws were just, though the punishment for breaking them was often quite severe. If someone contests the judgment of the king, his house will become a ruin. If someone contests the judgment of a dignitary, his head will be cut off. Telepino also took a new approach to foreign policy. He avoided protracted military campaigns and signed the first ever Hittite treaty with the land of Kizuwatna. Other Hittite kings would adopt his strategy and in time, Hittite treaties would become as effective as its military. Treaties were very important to the Hittites. In a sense, they were the glue which held together the Hittite empire. In fact, of all the treaties which have come down to us from the ancient Near East, more than half were found in the Hittite archives. Telepinu stabilized the kingdom and established peace, even if it was only temporary. The growing military might of Egypt in the south and the new Hurrian state in the east, the kingdom of Mitanni, made future military conflicts inevitable. In time of war, the king could call up ordinary Hittite citizens to strengthen his army. The common people were the subjects of the king and servants of the gods. Few Hittite texts directly describe the everyday life of the citizens. Most of the details can only be found in Hittite laws and official documents. Hittite society was sharply stratified, of course, into royalty at the top, the army commanders and administrators in the middle, and the peasantry, the vast bulk of the population at the base. While the upper and middle classes lived in large urban centers, many of the common people lived in scattered villages, sometimes far from the cities. During peacetime, the people worked the land, allotted to them by the king as compensation for their military or other services. Agriculture and animal husbandry were the economic backbone of the kingdom. The rural areas produced the food for the whole country. So important was farming that 40 out of the 200 articles in Hittite laws specifically dealt with agriculture and livestock. The peasants could either cultivate their own land or work royal land for a share of the crops. During the harvest season, men could also work for hire on someone else's farm. The rural Hittite settlements resembled the Wild West. Life could be harsh. High mountains cut off many villages both from the cities and from one another, making travel extremely difficult and dangerous. Frontier towns were vulnerable to attacks by bandits and enemy soldiers. Often, the Anatolian winter cut off communications completely between neighboring towns and cities, even burying the houses under mountains of snow. A harsh winter and bad harvest could lead to widespread famine. When the weather allowed travel, the farmers brought their goods to the Hittite marketplaces set up around the major cities and temples.
There, they traded for commodities or crafts and paid taxes to the court. The Hittite marketplace was a bazaar, tax office, and stock market, all rolled into one. Cosmopolitan in many ways, these bustling marketplaces were filled with people, both local and foreign, combing the streets for merchandise. It was even a good place to meet your future spouse. Hittite marriages were formed by strict agreements by which the men paid the woman's family what was called a bride price. The woman's role in the relationship was determined by her husband's wishes as well as her own strength of character. She was expected to be a wife, a helping hand, and most of all, to bear children. In contrast to many Near Eastern societies, Hittite women were at least partially compensated in divorce. In marriage, as in all aspects of Hittite life, fertility was crucial. Many flaws could be overlooked as long as men and women were fertile. One's worth in Hittite society was determined to some extent by one's ability to have offspring. And so fertility was of critical importance both for men and for women. It was imp uh, important if a woman was not able to conceive or if a man was impotent uh, that, that these things affected their well-being and, and their status in society. Um, and rituals would have to be performed to, to try to deal with these problems. One of the well-known fertility rituals was described by a Hittite healer named Pascuwati. If for some man reproductive power is absent, or he is not a man with regard to women, I place a spindle and a distaff in the patient's hand and instruct him to come through the gates. As he steps in, I take the spindle and distaff away from him, and I give him a bow and arrows. At the same time, I recite as follows. I have just taken femininity away from you and given you back masculinity. You have cast off the behavior of a woman and have taken on the behavior of a man. The effectiveness of this therapy remains unknown. The frontier society was not without its disputes. All cases were brought for arbitration before the king's local governors or the town's elders, who were under direct instructions from the king to exercise fairness. But more serious cases, such as sorcery, murder, or adultery, could be taken to only one place, the king's court at Hattusha. It was a marvel of engineering. A city literally carved out of rock. Its temples, houses, and the royal citadel stretched over an area of 400 acres, much larger than ancient Troy or Athens. Surrounded by imposing natural fortifications and miles of walls, it was considered impregnable. As the religious, economic, and administrative center of the land, it was one of the most important cities of the ancient world and the pride of the Hittites. Hattusha was the Hittite kingdom. Hattusha was divided into two districts, the lower and the upper city. Armories, archives, temples, government buildings, and grain depots that served the entire kingdom were all located in the capital. The king resided in the fortified citadel with his immediate family. Many of the important buildings, especially those with religious functions, were constructed on rock outcroppings. Huge crags were leveled to accommodate houses. For them, it was apparently no problem to shape rocks and cliffs in the way they wanted, and they put houses on almost every rock outcrop, every rock knoll you see here in the city. 
An ordinary Hittite structure was erected on a stone foundation with sun-dried mud bricks strengthened by a timber frame. The roofs were made of beams covered with reed and plaster. The Hittites were masters of stone, sometimes shaping blocks weighing more than 15 tons. Special bronze tubes were used to drill holes in the stone for the wooden framework. In some walls, the stone masonry was so fine that it is still impossible to slip a sheet of paper between two stones. Hittites were also able to shape and move huge blocks, especially the blocks you see at the city gates, but also blocks in the temples. For example, the largest block used in the big temple weighs about 40 tons. And they were uh, able to shape them and to move them, most probably with sledges and also with uh, big uh, wooden beams, and moving them slowly, slowly, actually the same way as it was done in Mesopotamia and also in Egypt. The Hittite engineers also designed a complex network of clay pipes that brought in water from the seven springs surrounding the capital. The water was collected in artificial ponds and distributed to houses through neighborhood fountains. In an age when most societies lacked sanitation, many Hittite houses were fitted with a drainage system connected to sewer mains beneath the streets. The clay pipes had access holes for cleaning. Any damaged part could just be disconnected from the main system and quickly repaired. First and foremost, the Hittites were warriors and their city was designed to make this clear to anyone who traveled to the capital. They surrounded Hattusha with massive stone walls that stretched for miles, with watchtowers and security tunnels located every 60 feet. The city could only be entered through eight primary gates, which were heavily guarded and fortified. The gates could only be approached by steep ramps that were flanked by walls and two towers, one outside and one inside. In times of crisis, people living outside the city were brought inside for protection. So strict was Hittite security that after everyone had entered the city, the gates were closed and sealed by local officials every evening. The seals were checked first thing in the morning to determine if Hattusha had been infiltrated by the enemy or their spies. Most of the city's population were employed in temples, the religious and sometimes the administrative centers of the empire. The artisan workshops, the protective deity statues, and the official archives of the kingdom were all located there. Copies of all texts ranging from treaties to prayers were meticulously stored in the royal archives. A king could easily become familiar with past events and refer to his predecessor's exploits. One of the strongest points of the Hittites is their enormous sense of history. The Hittites were, had a very strong conviction that the present is firmly rooted in the past and that every decision you now take must be based on the past and will, as such, have, of course, important consequences for the future as well. So they used their archives over centuries, they kept tablets, uh, to be able to consult them, to be able to draw from them for the present. One group of workers in the temples were indispensable to the administration of the kingdom, the scribes. They were the writers and translators of all Hittite documents and were among the king's most important advisers. A scribe, was required to spend many years mastering the difficult cuneiform script and the languages that were used in foreign correspondence. By the time they were appointed to the palace, scribes were well versed in many languages, history and politics. The Hittite state could not have functioned without the activity of the scribe. The scribe kept the records which allowed the king and his officials to perform their duties both within the human area and over against the gods. 
a unique glimpse into the personal lives of the scribes can be found at the end of a few official Hittite documents. I say to my dear brother Uzu, may it be well with you, and may the god Ea, king of wisdom, protect you in well-being. Presently, things are going well in your household, and everything is fine in regard to your wife. My dear brother should not worry at all. May my dear brother send greetings back to me. Say to my brother Himuili, in regard to what you wrote me about your sons-in-law, I've taken your point and will speak about it in the palace. A person will go to them and bring them into the presence of His Majesty. Many of these scribes received their early training by copying ancient texts. In addition to local scribes, many were brought in from distant lands like Syria and Babylonia. These people brought with them not only their skills, but also a legacy of myths that formed the core of Hittite literature. Most of these stories have survived thanks to the archives of Hattusha. Though the Hittite writings were influenced by Hurrian and Babylonian myths, they had their own distinct style and themes. Mythical traditions often tell us a great deal about a society's values and customs and traditions, and so too with the Hittites. Abhorrence of incest, the violation of family loyalties and the rules of hospitality, the behavior of wayward gods, all these find their echoes in Hittite mythology. And with their parade of uh, monsters and battles and the most extraordinary bizarre sexual coupling, couplings, all these things must have had enormous appeal at all levels of Hittite society. With their strong narratives and entertainment value, these myths passed down from generation to generation. Many of them even influenced Greek and Roman myths as well as the Bible. The Hurrian myths translated into Hittite, um, which are poetic epic, have enormously close links with early Greek poetry. Absolutely unmistakable links, nobody would deny them, to the extent that uh, the early Greek poets must in some way have had contact uh, with these stories of the origin of the kingship of heaven and the battles between the gods, because we have them on the one hand in, in the Hittite Hurrian versions from Hattusa, and on the other hand they appear in the Greek, early Greek poet Hesiod, and as a, indeed as a background to the Homeric epics. The year was 1400 BC a century after the death of King Telepinu. The Hittite kingdom enjoyed a period of relative peace and prosperity, but it was not to last. Egypt formed a military alliance with the kingdom of Mitanni and invaded Hittite territory in Syria. Lands in the east became disobedient. Azawa states in the west rebelled. These attacks from three sides shook the kingdom to its very foundations. But they were nothing compared to the assault that the Hittites would face from the north. The Kashkar were a group of northern tribes infamous for their defiance and ruthlessness. Capitalizing on the chaotic situation, they ravaged Hittite border towns in the north and pushed quickly south. could not withstand the Kashkar onslaught. It 
It was impossible for the Hittite army to defend all four fronts at the same time. In just a few years, the kingdom lost most of its possessions, retaining only a small piece of land in central Anatolia. The devastation was beyond the Hittites' worst nightmares, and their enemies were certain the kingdom was destroyed. The Egyptian pharaoh, Amenhotep III, summed it up in a letter to an ally. I have heard that everything is finished and the country Hattusha is paralyzed. But they were all wrong. The Hittites would emerge from this defeat stronger than ever. One man would raise the kingdom from the ashes and transform it into a mighty empire. He would come to be known as the King of Kings, the greatest Hittite ruler in history. His name was Shupilulima. Shupilulima was raised to be a fighter. He was a battle-hardened soldier and a skilled politician who carefully planned his every move. When the kingdom of Mitanni and the Kashkar attacked, his father was king. Shupilulima was his chief advisor and comrade in arms. The situation of the Hittite kingdom during the reign of Shupilulima's father was desperate. It was clear that uh, the king uh, did not control much more than the old heartlands of the Hittite Empire. The west had gone off, the north was difficult, the, the east, the south. And um, this is the situation in which Shupilyuma, as a prince, uh, came into the scene. After the fall of Hattusha, Shupilulima and his father retreated to the provincial capital of Shamuha. There, he painstakingly rebuilt his army and set out to recapture lost territories one by one. Most of the lands were quickly reclaimed by the Hittites, either by force or treaties. But as Hittite successes mounted, Shupilulima's father fell ill. On his deathbed, to the surprise of everyone, he passed over Shupilulima and appointed another son as his successor. Shupilulima was furious. He rebelled, seized the throne, and had his brother murdered. He violated Telepinu's proclamation of royal succession. As the new king, Shupilulima continued the campaign to rebuild the kingdom. After consolidating his position in Anatolia, he conquered the Azawa lands in the west and the Kashkar in the north. Hattusha was once again under Hittite rule. Shupilulima then marched south and crushed the powerful Syrian coalition. Within a year, most of the lands in northern Syria were under his rule. Of the enemies that had attacked the Hittites, only the kingdom of Mitanni remained unconquered. Shupilulima would not rest until payback was complete. In a relentless campaign, he attacked the Mitanni kingdom and subjugated all small states loyal to it. Shupilulima reinforced his military victories with political ones. He formed an alliance with the Syrian state of Ugarit. Ugarit's alliance would not only give the Hittites access to crucial trade routes, but would also provide a valuable source of tribute. The alliance proved to be a shrewd political move. Ugarit became the Hittites' most important source of revenue for the next two centuries. Although he was a skilled politician, Shupilulima's greatest asset was the Hittite military, the most powerful of its day. The military was made up of the infantry, and the chariot units. The infantrymen were mostly armed with spears and shields. For close combat, they used bronze, sickle-shaped swords and axes. The Hittite military life was harsh 
and governed by strict discipline. The troops were expected to march long distances through difficult terrain and then fight the enemy. During some campaigns, they had to carry their weapons and shields for 900 miles under the fierce heat of the Anatolian sun. The elite unit and the pride of the Hittite army was the chariot force. The chariot force was the most powerful weapon the Hittites had, charging into battle at the beginning and often ensuring victory before the battle had barely begun. The Hittites did not invent the battle chariot, but they perfected it. In their hands, it became the equivalent of the modern day tank. In most chariots of the day, the axle was located at the end of the cart, which carried two soldiers. The Hittites mounted the axle near the middle of the cart, making the chariot more stable and able to carry a larger load. This meant an extra soldier and more weapons, giving the Hittite chariots superiority in fire and manpower over their Egyptian or Hurrian counterparts. The Hittite charioteers could devastate the enemy by hurling spears and shooting arrows from a distance. They could then attack the enemy ranks and crush the fleeing soldiers by striking them from both sides of the chariot. The Hittite chariots were so feared that according to the Old Testament, their thunder made the Syrians tremble with fear. As far as Hittite military strategy in battle was concerned, the important thing was to try to get your enemy to meet you in open battle, because this is what the Hittite infantry were trained for. This is where the chariotry were most effective. With his formidable military, Shupilulima was an unstoppable force in the Near East. Shupilulima wanted to extend Hittite influence to Mesopotamia by taking the daughter of the Babylonian king as his wife. This presented a problem, since he was already married, and his wife held the official title Tawanana, the Hittite queen. Shupilulima's solution that would enable him to marry the Babylonian princess was simple. He dismissed his wife, the mother of all his sons, from the capital and banished her into exile. Soon, the Babylonian princess traveled to Hattusha and married Shubilulima. She was now Tawanana, queen of the Hittites. After nearly 20 years of rule, Shubilulima had achieved dominance over the entire region. The Hittite lands stretched from the Black Sea in the north to the Euphrates in the east and the mountains of Lebanon in the south. The kingdom Shubilulima raised from the ruins had become an empire. Shubilulima still remembered the devastation his kingdom had endured under his enemies. One Mitannian stronghold remained before his revenge was complete, the city of Carchemish. In 1327 BC, Shubilulima besieged the city. As he waited for the city's surrender, a messenger brought a letter from Egypt. It was to mark the beginning of one of the greatest mysteries in ancient history. My husband is dead, and I have no son. But it is said that you have many sons. If you could send me one of your sons, he could become my husband. On no account will I take one of my subjects and make him my husband. I am very afraid.
The author of the letter was the Egyptian queen Anki Sanamun. Her dead husband was none other than the boy king of Egypt, Tutankhamun. Sapriyo must have been stunned. I mean, here is Egypt being given to him on a golden platter, a thing that he never dreamed of. And of course, that must have pricked the pride of some of the Egyptians, whether in ancient times or modern times. Why would an Egyptian queen ask to marry a Hittite king's son? Why would she send a plea to her country's greatest rival? Suspicious that he was being deceived, Shupi Lulima dispatched his chamberlain to Egypt to meet with Ankisanamun. Meanwhile, he captured Carchemish and returned home for the winter. The following spring, Shupi Lulima's chamberlain returned with an angry letter from Ankisanamun. Why did you say, they deceive me? Had I a son, would I have written about my own and my country's shame to a foreign land? I have written to no other country. Only to you I have written. They say you have many sons, so give me one of yours. To me, he will be husband. In Egypt, he will be king. It was almost too good to be true. A Hittite prince would sit on the Egyptian throne, and the Hittites would become the greatest power of the known world. Persuaded, Shupilulima sent his son to Egypt to marry Anke Sanamun. anxiously awaited the news of his son's safe arrival in Egypt. But none came. Finally, after a few weeks, a messenger brought him a letter. The prince was dead. He had been murdered by Anke Sanamun's rivals the moment he entered Egyptian territory. Siones, ki quit ier. Hittites spared no one. Soldiers sacked and burned Egyptian towns in Syria. Shupilulima brought back many prisoners to Hattusha, but this would have terrible consequences for the Hittite Empire. The captives carried with them a dreadful plague. The disease spread rapidly, decimating the population. The Hittite lands were devastated. We have no idea of the nature of the plague beyond the fact that it was brought to Hattie by Egyptian prisoners of war. 
but there's absolutely no doubt about the desolation, devastation it caused in the Hittite land, carrying off large numbers of the population and virtually reducing the kingdom to the brink of starvation. As the Hittites prepared for a major conflict with the Egyptians, terrible news came from Hattusha. In 1322 BC, the 22nd year of his reign, King Shupilulima died from the plague. Following Hittite funerary rituals, the king's body was borne in state for cremation enabling the king to complete his journey to the afterlife. Among the mourners at the funeral was the king's Babylonian wife. She would retain her status as queen in the next reign, the plague carried off Shupilulima's successor immediately after his accession. The empire had now lost two rulers in a single year. Power now rested on the shoulders of Shupilulima's youngest son. Moshili II inherited the most powerful, but also the most vulnerable empire in the Near East. You are a child. You know nothing and instill no fear in me. Your land is in ruins and your soldiers and chariots are few. Against your soldiers, I have many soldiers. Against your chariots, I have many chariots. Your father had many soldiers and chariots, but you are a child. How can you match him? Mershali's position on the throne was far from secure. Enemies on all sides waited for the right moment to attack. But for now, Mershali's most pressing problem was internal. The Great Plague continued to ravage the empire. What is this, O oh gods, which you have done? A plague that you have led into the land. The land of Hatti, all of it is dying so no one prepares sacrificial loaves and libations for you. The plowmen who used to work the fields of the gods are dead. The plague is no way over, so men keep on dying in the haughty land. As for me, the agony of my heart and the anguish of my soul I cannot endure any more. For whatever reason, people are dying. Let that be found out. Storm God of Hati, my Lord, save my life. I kneel down to you and cry out, have mercy. Let this plague be removed from Hati. Nothing helped. In desperation, the people, under their king's guidance, turned to the oracles. The oracles revealed the cause of the punishment. Mershali's father, Shupilulima, had murdered his own brother, Tutalia, and attacked Egypt, both without the approval of the storm god. Storm god of Hatti, my lord, you gods, my lords, it is true that man is sinful. My father also sinned and transgressed against the word of the storm god of Hati, my lord. My father died because of the blood of Tutalia. But I have not sinned in any respect. Of those who sinned and did do evil, not one is still here today. It is so. The sin of the father falls upon his son. So my father's sin has fallen upon me. 
On behalf of the land I am now presenting you, the gods, my lords, with a gift on account of the plague. I am making restitution. May you, the gods, my lords, be well disposed towards me once more. Finally, after devastating the Empire for 20 years, the plague ended. Musili's plague prayers are absolutely fascinating documents in a number of different ways. To start with, they're very fine works of Hittite literature, but they tell us a great deal more than that. He almost speaks to us uh, with his own voice, in fact he does, uh, in expressing the, the great anguish and anxiety which he feels all the time as a result of the plague. So we do see him as, as a very human figure there uh, in his uh, laying himself bare to the gods, effectively, but also to us. All Hittite kings had to be warriors. Even as he fought the plague within the empire, Mershali attacked the Azawa lands in the west and achieved total victory. He also defeated the rebellious Kashka lands and secured the empire's northern borders. He proved that against his enemies, he could be even more ruthless than his father, especially to those who harbored fugitives. Now seize him and hand him over to me. If you do not hand him over, I will come and destroy you along with your land. The texts give us two rather different sides to Morshili's characters. His prayers show him to have been a very sensitive, humane man, deeply pious, scrupulous in his attention to his duties, devoted to his family, and a man with a very profound sense of conscience. On the other hand, his military records show that he could be a totally ruthless warlord, just like his father. Do you gods not see how she has turned the entire house of my father into the stone house of the protective god? Some things she brought in from the land of Babylon, Others in the populace she handed over. She left nothing. My father's house she destroyed. Mershali's most vexing personal problem was his stepmother, Tawanana, the Babylonian widow of Shupilulima. Tawanana was the royal title conferred upon the queen, the chief consort of the king. It was an influential position both religiously and politically as she was the chief priestess of the land. The queen kept her title even if she survived her husband's death and lived into the reign of his successor. Sometimes this was a source of tension between her and the new king's wife. This was certainly the case for Mershali. Tawanana is rather like the proverbial wicked stepmother. She became an ever more powerful influence in the royal household during her husband's final years, and she continued to dominate the household after his death. And this was strongly resented by her stepson, the new king Morshili. But in the Hittite tradition, she continued to be the reigning queen. Even so, there are clear signs that Morshili tried to supplant her with his own wife, Gasulawiya. As he contemplated what to do with his stepmother, Mershali received tragic news from Syria. One of his brothers, the viceroy in Aleppo, was dead. A few months later, his other brother, the viceroy in Carchemish, also died. In the ninth year of his reign, Mershali had lost his two most important supporters. Then, his wife suddenly fell ill. Despite all his pleas to the gods and oracles, her condition deteriorated. The Hittite physicians were helpless. No one could diagnose her illness. Foul play was suspected. Oh gods, 
It is in these last days that your servant Gosalavia became ill. Once more, look with favor upon the princess and cure her of this illness. Bring it to an end and restore her to good health. And henceforth, the princess will bestow unceasing praises upon you and will forever proclaim nothing but your holy name. But within a year, Morshali's wife died. The king was devastated. My punishment is the death of my wife. Throughout the days of life, my soul goes down to the dark netherworld on her account. For me, it has been unbearable. Morshali believed that his stepmother had used black magic and caused his wife's death. Black magic, especially towards a member of the royal family, was a capital crime in the Hittite Empire. In Hattusha hereafter, sorcery must be exercised. Whoever in the royal family knows about sorcery, you must seize him and bring him to the gate of the palace. Whoever does not bring him here, things will go badly for this man and his house. The oracles revealed that the Tawanana was guilty. It was determined by oracle inquiry that I should execute her. I did not execute her, but I deposed her from the office of Siwanzani Priestess. I punished her with this one thing, and I sent her down from the palace. Moshele's documents indicate that he was suddenly struck with a speech affliction that perhaps was symptomatic of a more serious ailment caused by years of strain and grief. I traveled to Tilkanu. A storm burst forth and the storm god thundered terrifyingly. I was afraid. Speech withered in my mouth and it came forth somewhat haltingly. One asks oneself, how could a man bear this kind of accumulated tragedy? The responsibility that he felt for his people in the plague, the apparent attack of the gods upon him, and then the death of his own dear wife. He must have had enormous resources to draw upon. It gives us great respect for him as a person and lifts him out from among all the other kings as someone that we can all relate to because we all know a little bit of what it feels like to have tragedies that he had, but nothing like the magnitude. Moshali had ascended to the throne at a young age. In the face of adversity, he had managed to maintain the Hittite Empire at the forefront of the Near Eastern stage. By conquering the Western lands, he expanded the kingdom to its greatest borders. Despite all his personal loss, he had made Hattusha the equal of Babylon and Thebes. By the end of Murshali's reign in 1295 BC, there were new powerful enemies encroaching on Hittite borders. Assyria in the east coveted new possessions in Hittite territory. But the greatest threat was from the south. In the late 13th century BC, a new powerful dynasty emerged in Egypt. In 1279 BC, 16 years after the death of Mershali II, the accession of the third king of the 19th Egyptian dynasty marked a turning point for the Near East. This new ruler would become the mightiest pharaoh in Egypt's history. 
he was Ramesses II. Ambitious and motivated, Ramesses was anxious to assert Egyptian power in Syria, the crossroads of the ancient world. Ramesses II is one of these characters that is very, very rich. First of all, he had this sense of history. And in a way, he wanted to force himself upon history. And he also dreamt of measuring up to, great, to his great predecessors, such as Thutmose III, the Napoleon of ancient Egypt, or even his father, Siti I. He wanted to supersede them in his prowess, especially in the battlefield. By his fourth year on the throne, Ramesses has solidified his internal affairs and set his sights on Syria. In 1275 BC, he conducted a reconnaissance mission to his subject states and attacked Hittite territory. Ramesses saw that Egyptian vassals were loyal. Hittite power seemed weak. The conquest of Syria could begin. Ramesses's rival in Syria was the Hittite ruler, Muwatali, the 22nd king of the dynasty and Mursali's oldest son. But more prominent, more politically gifted, was Moatali's younger brother, Hattusheli, the second most powerful man in the Hittite Empire. Hattusheli was the youngest son of Mursheli. He had been a sickly child and not expected to live to adulthood. While I was still a child, my lady Ishtar sent my brother Muwatali to my father Mursheli in a dream with the message. For Hattusheli, the years are short. He will die soon. Therefore, give him into my service and let him be my priest. If you do so, he will continue to live. And my father took me and gave me to the goddess for service. And serving as priest to the goddess, I poured libations. And so at the hand of my lady Ishtar, I saw prosperity. Despite constant bouts of ill health, Hattusheli had fought beside his brother in the northern campaigns and proved his worth as a commander. His account of his life does show, of course, that he was extremely ambitious. Uh, he attributes his success to the uh, support of his patron goddess. Um, but he also shows himself to have been a very able soldier, and what we know of him from elsewhere and from later shows him to have been a, what one would probably call a cultured man as well. In 1274 BC, Kadesh was under Hittite rule, and Amuru was under Egyptian control. The loyalties of other states in Syria constantly fluctuated between the two sides. But Kadesh was the most strategic city in Syria, and it marked the border between the two powers. Whoever controlled it would control Syria. The fate of the Near East was to be decided on the plains of Kadesh. Armourers cast the weapons. Charioteers reinforced their vehicles. The infantrys trained tirelessly. Both sides prepared for a momentous battle. The Hittites reinforced their standing army with troops from 18 vassal states. They amassed 37,000 infantry soldiers and 3,500 chariots. Ramesses formed an army of four divisions, the Amon, the Ray, the Tar, and the Seth, each made up of 5,000 men. It was the greatest assembly of forces the world had ever seen. The Hittite forces left Anatolia and marched south to Syria, joining with their allies along the way. Hattusheli was the commander of the Hittite infantry and the chariots of the north. Ramesses 
led his Amman division north up the coast of Palestine. But in his haste to face the Hittites, Ramesses made a tactical error. He increased the distance between him and the Tar and Seth divisions. In case of an attack, he could only rely on the Ray and his own Amman division, just half his total force. In May of 1274 BC, a month after leaving their capital, the Egyptians were 10 miles from Kadesh. They were now in enemy territory. But the Hittites were nowhere to be seen. As Ramesses prepared to cross the Orontes River at Shabtuna, his forces captured two Bedouins. Under interrogation, they claimed that the Hittite army was located 100 miles further north at Aleppo and that, intimidated by Ramesses, they were fleeing back to Hattusha. The Bedouins were lying. The overconfident Ramesses committed a second tactical error. The next day, he crossed to the north bank of the river and once again split his forces. He set up camp at the northwestern side of Kadesh with his Amman division. His other division, the Ray, remained on the south bank and the Tar and Seth divisions were still many miles to the south. As Ramesses' royal pavilion was erected near Kadesh, his troops captured two Hittite spies. Under torture, the spies talked. Behold, the ruler of Hatti has already come, together with the many foreign lands that he brought as allies. See, they are poised, armed, and ready to fight behind old Kadesh. The Hittite army was actually south of the river and ready to attack the Ray division. Ramesses had been fooled. The pharaoh quickly dispatched two officers to warn the Ray division, which was still marching towards his camp. But they were too late. The Ray Division quickly collapsed. Survivors rushed towards Ramesses' camp in panic with the entire Hittite army in pursuit. Only the Amman Division stood between the Hittites and total domination of Syria. Hattusheli and his brother were confident of the outcome. Kino Nastar Huvatar. <laughs> 
It seemed that only a miracle could save Ramesses. And one did. The pharaoh was able to hold his flanks. The vassal soldiers, so crucial for the Hittite strength, broke ranks. Lured by the booty in the Egyptian camp, they abandoned their positions and started to plunder. At the same time, Egyptian reinforcements arrived from Amuru and attacked the Hittites on their flank. With their forces in disarray, the Hittites missed the opportunity for a decisive victory. Both sides suffered heavy losses. At the end of the day, I think there was a stalemate between the Egyptians and the Hittites. You see, the Hittites have lost most of their chariots, and the Egyptian infantry was in a bad shape. On the other hand, the Egyptians kept their chariots, and the Hittites had their infantry almost intact. So both kings shrewdly thought that this can go on and on, and there was not going to be a winner. Ramesses withdrew his forces to Egypt. With their chariots immobilized, Muwatali and Hattusheli could not pursue the pharaoh. Although the Hittites missed their chance for total victory, they had destroyed half of the Egyptian army at Kadesh. Shortly after, the Hittites recaptured Amuru and Abba, the site of modern Damascus, re-establishing Hittite rule in the region. Tensions, however, would remain high for the next 16 years. The Battle of Kadesh discouraged the Egyptians to continue a policy of expansionism. For Ramses, personally, most likely, it ended a dream of uh, fame and prestige. But the Egyptians had no problem with that. The royal ideology um, made sure that the king was always successful. After the confrontation with the Hittites, Ramesses adorned the walls of his temples at Karnak, Luxor, Abydos, and Abu Simbel with reliefs depicting his version of the battle. Thanks to his detailed portrayal, the Battle of Kadesh remains the most completely reconstructable battle of ancient history, despite the bombastic depictions. I slaughtered them. I killed them wherever they were. And one called to other, This is no man who is among us. This is Seth the Mighty. Baal is in his limbs. His deeds are not the deeds of a man. Never before has one man alone, without foot soldiers and chariots, defeated hundreds of thousands. Ramesses' biased version would be the only historical source for the battle for 3,000 years. But the Hittite tablets, excavated in Hattusha in the 20th century, painted a more accurate portrayal of the battle and its aftermath. After the Battle of Kadesh, Hattusheli embarked on his journey back towards Hattusha. On his way, he stopped in the holy city of Lower Zantia to honor his protective goddess, Ishtar. There, he met the daughter of the local priest, 25 years his junior, she was a priestess also serving Ishtar. She was young, elegant, and charismatic. Her name was Puduhepa. For Hattusheli, it was a match made in heaven. At the command of the goddess, I married Puduhepa, the daughter of Bentipshari, the priest and we became a family. The goddess gave us the love of husband and wife, and we had sons and daughters. Puduhepa was not only a devoted wife and mother, but in time would become the most prominent Hittite woman in history.
This is the only case I know of anywhere in ancient Near Eastern literature where the word love is used to describe the relationship between a prince or a king and his consort. And that's probably significant. The relationship between Hattusila and Pudahepa was very much a practical, working, political relationship. But I believe it was strongly underpinned by a deep mutual love and affection which each had for the other and that lasted for the whole of their lives together. Two years after Kadesh, around 1272 BC, King Muwatali died. The king's son and Hattusheli's nephew, Uri Teshub, now sat on the throne. Hattusheli was the ruler of the upper land. But from the start, it was an uneasy relationship. Uri Teshub was leery of his uncle's increasing power and saw him as a potential threat. Seven years after his accession, Uri Teshub stripped Hattusheli of most of his lands and titles. Hattusheli's reaction was swift. Hattusheli assembled an army in the north, rebelled and overthrew his nephew after a brief civil war. For seven years I submitted, but at a divine command and with human urging, Urhi Teshub sought to destroy me. He took Hakpisa and Nerik from me. Now I submitted to him no longer. I made war upon him. I marched back to Samuha to face Urhi Teshub, and I brought him down like a captive. By seizing the Hittite throne, Hattusheli like his grandfather, Shupilulima, violated the Telepinu proclamation. He justified his actions and disclosed his nephew's fate in a skillfully crafted Hittite document. It has come to be known as the Apology of Hattusheli, one of the earliest autobiographies in history. Mahan Mamukan, or Hitesubas, Enisan Sianus Asolanausta. No asma arsaniat numu uwai udas. He took away from me all my subjects. He would have planned another and would have proceeded into the land of Karadunia. But when I heard of the matter, I arrested him and banished him across the sea. Perhaps one of the most extraordinary documents in the whole Boyerske archive is the so-called Apology of Hattusili, so-called because it is his defense of his usurpation of the throne. And in it, he gives an account of his early life, which is uh, perhaps almost unparalleled in its detail. The Apology is the earliest text in which we have a uh, sustained self-defense of a particular individual's activities over a lifetime. Around 1267 BC, Assyria gained strength in the east. Ramesses II was into his twelfth year as pharaoh, and Moses was supposedly leading his people out of Egypt in the biblical exodus. In the land of Hatti, Hattusheli, now Hattusheli III, was king, and his wife, Puduhepa, was beside him as the queen. For the Hittites, it was a time of peace and prosperity. Hattusheli's first order of business was to establish strong political ties with his neighbors. Royal marriages and treaties were the best ways to do this. As the First Lady, Puduhepa functioned as royal matchmaker, organizing the marriages of her family members to foreign kings. She exchanged letters with vassal kings and even had her own seals for correspondence. She became a constant presence in many affairs of the kingdom, sometimes presiding over legal cases and advising her husband in foreign affairs. Puduhepa's most profound influence was on state religion. 
In 400 years, the Hittite religion had accumulated a vast array of gods from many different cultures. Every large city, every small frontier town had its own set of deities. The pantheon with hundreds of gods became frustratingly confusing both for the Hittites and their neighbors, especially in trying to compose treaties. And in regard to the fact that I have made this treaty tablet for you, the thousand gods are now summoned to assembly. They shall observe and listen and be witnesses. The sun god of heaven, the sun goddess of Arena, the storm god of heaven, the storm god of Hatti, the storm god of the army, the storm god of Nerik, storm god of Aleppo. The list went on and on. As chief priestess of the empire, Puduhepa, with the encouragement of her husband, ordered the collection and cataloging of religious texts. She revised rituals and organized the many deities in the pantheon. By the end of Hattusili's first decade on the throne, around 1260 BC, the Assyrian problem could no longer be avoided. Before confronting the threat from Assyria, Hattusili knew that he had to secure his Egyptian flank. Also, an agreement with a major power like Egypt would strengthen his image among his own subjects. Ramesses felt the same way about his own position. So, in 1259 BC, after decades of hostility, the king of Hatti and the pharaoh of Egypt signed a peace treaty. The Hittite version containing the seals of Hattusili and Puduhepa was composed in Akkadian and sent to Egypt. There it was translated into Egyptian and carved on the walls of the temples at Karnak and the Ramesseum. The Egyptian version of the agreement was also written in Akkadian and then sent to Hattusha. A clay copy of this version is on display in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum in Turkey. The text in Egypt is Hattusili's composition, while the one in Istanbul is Ramesses's. A copy of the version in Istanbul is now in the United Nations headquarters in New York. Ramesses, the great king, king of Egypt, has made himself in a treaty upon a silver tablet with Hattusili, the great king, king of the land of Hatti. He is my brother, and I am his brother. He is at peace with me, and I am at peace with him forever. And we will create our brotherhood and our peace, and they will be better than the former brotherhood and peace of Egypt and Hatti. Both sides would honor the agreement. Due to the treaty that was signed between the two powers, at least there was peace for some time in the, in the Middle East not only for the two powers, but for, for the whole region. But most important that these people at that time kept their word, because peace went on between the two nations. This also gave the opportunity to Ramesses II to embark upon his uh, ambitious program of building. That's why we have his buildings all over the place. The peace treaty initiated a correspondence between the courts of Ramesses II and Hattusili III that would yield more than 100 letters, 15 of them addressed directly to Puduhepa. Thus says Nefertari, great queen of Egypt, say to Puduhepa, great queen of Hatti, my sister. I, your sister, am well. My land is well. May you, my sister, be well. May your land be well. One interesting exchange concerned Hattusili's sister. Thus says Hattusili, the great king, king of Hatti, say thus to Ramses, great king of Egypt, let my brother send a man to prepare medicines for her so that she might be caused to give birth. I, the king, your brother, know about Matanazi, my brother's sister. She is said to be 50 or 60 years old. 
it is not possible to prepare medicines for a woman who has completed 50 or 60 years so that she might still be caused to give birth. Puduhepa knew that the best way to secure relations with Egypt was to make Ramesses their son-in-law. However, the arrangement was delayed due to a fire in Hattusha. The deity who installed me in this place has not denied me anything. You, as son-in-law, will take my daughter in marriage. My sister, you promised to give me your daughter. That's what you wrote to me. But you have withheld her. And now you are angry with me. Why have you not now given her to me? Do not withhold the daughter from me any longer. I have indeed withheld my daughter. You will not disapprove of it, but you will approve of it. At the moment, I'm not able to give her to you. As you, my brother, know, the storehouse of Hatti is a burned structure. The daughter finally arrived in Egypt and entered Ramesses' harem. Ramesses II was now Hattusili III's son-in-law. Egyptian artists immortalized the event on a wall at the entrance of Abu Simbel. The Egyptian Hittite correspondence is really a very remarkable collection of letters. And I think it, it emphasizes to us, which we see from uh, many periods of history, the great importance of, of personal contacts in international diplomacy. Here are two kings that were adversaries before. They met a lot on the battlefield, but now they call each other brother. Here are two queens, one of them writes to the other one, calling her sister. This adds to, to, the, to the human touches that sometimes we don't get from the official or formal inscriptions or letters. In a way, that gives, uh, gives us an idea what peace can do. And it's, it, 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 it strengthens our belief in the goodness of human nature. In his later years, Hattusili stabilized his borders with a series of campaigns, holding the Assyrians at bay, and began a massive building program in Hattusha. The great temple was enlarged. Many new temple buildings were added to the upper city, and the construction of the religious sanctuary at Yazilikaya was begun. Some of these projects were expanded and completed during the reign of his son, Tuthalia IV. By 1240 BC, Hattusili, always frail, was terminally ill. Puduhepa took over most of his official duties and did everything she could to alleviate his suffering. She asked Ramesses for Egyptian physicians, consulted oracles and begged the gods. Hattusili, that servant of yours, 
is ill. If anyone has made an offering to the gods to bring evil on Hattushili, except not these words. Please let evil not touch Hattushili, my husband. To Hattushili give long years, months, and days. Her prayers were in vain. Tushali's death marked the end of one of the greatest marriages of the ancient world. Puduhepa continued as queen into her son's reign and lived to be an old woman. Hattushali's reign was the last golden age of the Hittite Empire. The kingdom was now faced with the impending danger from the Assyrians in the east, as well as from the growing power of the vassal states in the south and west. During and after the reign of Tutalia IV, Hattushili's son, dynastic rivalries, drought and famine crippled the empire. The Hittites lost their grip on their vassal kings. In less than 30 years after the death of Hattushili, the 450-year-old empire was reduced from the mightiest force of the Near East to a kingdom barely clinging to its existence. Its fall was to be as swift and puzzling as its rise. There are records of only four more kings after Hattusili III the archives suddenly stop. It is believed that the empire fell along with its vassal states in northern Syria only two generations after Hattusili's reign, in roughly 1200 BC. After the empire's collapse, the Hittites abandoned the capital and moved to the east and south. Hattusha would never again regain the glory it once had under the Hittites. The collapse of the Hittite Empire was also the end of the Bronze Age in Anatolia. It was the beginning of a new era, a Dark Age of three centuries, followed by the Iron Age and Greek, Roman, Byzantine and Turkish settlements on Hittite lands. The Hittites forever changed the Near East with their pantheon of gods, their legal system, myths, and military. They established a pathway between the ancient East and West. Although the Hittite Empire fell in 1200 BC, its people lived on. The whole central area was lost to the Hittites, that is, the old land of Hatti, 
But the southeastern provinces, the southeastern plateau, the Taurus states, the Euphrates states, and North Syria uh, continued as what are called Neo-Hittite states, uh, with uh, the Hittite traditions of writing, art, and architecture. In thinking about what made the Hittites so special, we'd really have to say that they were not a highly innovative or creative people. What was noteworthy about them was the way they absorbed and preserved many of the elements of the civilizations of their Near Eastern neighbors, which enabled them to play an extremely important role in the preservation and transmission of these to later civilizations. And in the field of international diplomacy, they were at the forefront of the ancient peoples. And that's an important point because their long lease of power in the Near East was as much due to their diplomatic and political skills as it was to their prowess in the field of battle. That really does demonstrate that diplomacy can be at least as effective as military force in maintaining a country's power and influence in a particular region. The Hittites left an indelible mark on the Near East. Every part of Turkey resonates with their monuments, artifacts, and inscriptions. The voices of Shupilulima, Hattusheli, Murshali, and Puduhepa echo in every corner of the land. And the vast ruins of Hattusha remind us of the magnificence that once was the Hittite Empire.